Maddie, I think we said we'll record it at 35. It's fine. Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started in just a minute. We're just letting everybody into the room. Okay, we'll just we'll get started in just another minute. We're letting folks, I see a lot of people are still joining. So we'll give this another minute to let people sign on. Okay, I'm gonna um, introduce myself. My name is Lisa Hepburn. Um, welcome to the Center of Excellence for Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health Consultations Conference, uh, Equity from the Start. As I said, I'm your session facilitator. I am um, uh, an evaluator at the Center of Excellence, so I'm going to help facilitate today's session along with Madeline Mazel, who is our behind-the-scenes tech person. So you won't see her today, but she's operating behind the scenes. Uh, this session is being recorded and transcription is available through the Zoom platform should you have any questions. Please feel free to relay your questions in the chat. I will be monitoring the chat. Um, we also wanted to let you know before we begin that the views, policies, and opinions expressed in this presentation are of those of the uh, staff, of the authors and the presenters and do not necessarily reflect those of SAMHSA or HHS. That said, I would be happy to pass this over to Stephanie Gomez, who is our presenter today. Welcome, Stephanie. Um, and she will talk to you today about applying the FAN model. So off to you, Stephanie. Thanks. All right. Thanks so much, Lisa. So yes, uh, my name is Stephanie Gomez. And just so you um, have a little reference for where I am, I am uh, um in Sacramento, California today, enjoying a lovely rain that we had last night and this morning. Um, I am a licensed clinical social worker and I am endorsed here in California as an infant family, early childhood mental health specialist, but I am employed with the Sacramento County Office of Education, a really large um, county office of education, you see about 14 districts, um, and I serve as the coordinator of staff and family support, which means um, I have one of the greatest jobs in the world because I, I get to work in multiple departments. I have one foot in our special education department where I am doing consultation and reflective supervision with our um, Part C early intervention uh, infant development program, but also our inclusive programs. And then I have another foot in our early learning department, um, providing support to our Help Me Grow team um, and our early Head Start home visitors. 
So a lot of reflective practice that I provide, a lot of consultation, um, and even some direct work with, with little ones and their families. So I'm very, very fortunate. All right, so um, I want to share with you a little bit about my journey where over the past couple of years, we had a project where we wanted to partner with our very new school-based mental health and wellness department at the Sacramento County Office of Education. I also should say we refer to ourselves as SCOE. So I will probably uh, use that acronym um, throughout the presentation today. So a portion of this presentation was originally created as part of my capstone project this past spring when I completed the Napa Infant Parent Mental Health Fellowship um, at UC Davis. And today I will be presenting on uh, my theoretical approach to collaborating with complex systems and tell you a little bit about those outcomes and the work still to be accomplished. And then specifically, I'll be highlighting how I use Dr. Linda Gilkerson's fan model to guide my thinking and partnering with really complex systems over the past couple of years. So let's advance forward here. Uh, let me first tell you a little bit about the history of this project. So in 2020, SCOE partnered with the Sacramento County Department of Health Services to place a mental health clinician in every single school in our county. And just so that you can understand the scope of that plan, there are 380 public schools in our county. It was estimated it would take at least 10 years to reach capacity, hire all that staff, um, and SCOE developed a plan with the community to outline goals for that project. So here was the goal that they came up with, to transform all public schools in the county into centers of wellness where every adult supports the healthy development and overall well-being of students. And the plan documents five priorities that you see here, but I've highlighted that second goal, whole child and whole family approaches, because we really felt like this was the best port of entry to partner with the department. And the plan does expand each priority and it clearly um, indicates an support students and, and meet the wellness needs of the whole family. So we really saw that as an opportunity to align the goals and priorities of their department with those of ours and the early learning department. So at that time, our early learning department was the holder of a $3 million ACES of Care grant. And we were tasked with reducing adverse childhood experiences in our county. No small feat, right? And the Early Learning Department also manages our Help Me Grow Sacramento program. And so for those of you who might not be familiar with Help Me Grow, it's a national initiative and it's offered by each individual county and state. And it's a free resource to all families in our county uh, with children birth to five. And we conduct developmental screenings and then we link children to community resources for further assessment when it's indicated. And our initial Help Me Grow data identified a really significant need for increased infant early childhood and mental health services in our community. But we knew that we couldn't take that work on all by ourselves. We really needed to partner with other um, departments and agencies in order to leverage those resources. So although our early learning department, we envisioned this really natural partnership with this new school-based mental health and wellness department, some challenges emerged pretty quickly. And we realized um, pretty early on that our partners really had very little knowledge of infant early childhood mental health. There was no understanding of the unique nature of working with young children under the age of five and their families. 
there was um, sort of an assumption that just any licensed person could do this work. Um, it wasn't seen as science. Um, our administration didn't really see the value in sending a clinician through further training. We offered to fund one of their clinicians to go through the Napa Fellowship and they did not see the value in that and did not take us up on that offer. And we would attempt to share articles, you know, provide information and research and on the field. And we were pretty much met with no response whatsoever. So during that time in 2021, we attempted a very small pilot project with the school-based mental health and wellness department. And so in the pilot, we identified two clinicians who were based at elementary schools where there was also a preschool or a kindergarten program, TK here. And we envisioned that the clinicians and the Help Me Grow staff would work together so that they would screen the youngest students and then connect them with that clinician who's based at their school site. But after several months, we were told by their department that the pilot was not successful and they asked to pause and they asked if we could revisit it again next year. So I spend a lot of my Napa Fellowship Reflective Supervision time consulting on this challenge, as you can imagine. So I don't know about you, but for a clinician like myself, when I went to graduate school 20 years ago, I did not study systems and policy work in graduate school. I just envisioned myself as a clinician working with children and families. But over the years, as I've taken on more challenges and responsibilities as a manager and now as a consultant, I'm really finding that I need to learn how to partner with complex systems if I'm going to make meaningful change in my community. So as we walk through this session today, I'd like to ourselves in the theory of the consultative stance. And I was so happy to hear um, them refer to this morning in the, the morning welcoming message. Um, and actually, um, they talked a little bit about this article and this, this um, resource that you have um, on the Center for Excellence website. So I would encourage you to look at that in depth. I'm not going to go over all the 10 elements today, but I did want to highlight the top five that I was thinking about um, as I worked with this system the past couple years. So for me, this is the idea that the way I am in relationship with others is going to be the model for how others are going to be with infants, young children, families, teachers. Um, so I will refer to some of these core elements as I go through uh, the presentation today that I was holding in mind. And then for those of you who are attending today who are consultants, um, if you're like me and you did not have specific training in systems work, I would like to invite you to think about what theoretical model or core elements of this consultative stance may be helpful in guiding your work only in consultation, but in opportunities to partner with systems. So in a reflective meeting that I had with one of my supervisors during my fellowship time, she asked me about which researcher or luminary stood out to me. And I had shared about my interest in Dr. Gilkerson's fan model and it just really got me thinking. I got really excited the next couple of days. And I just thought if I can use the fan with families and in consultation, how might I use the fan to guide my work with complex systems? So many of you may be aware of Linda Gilkerson's fan model from the Fussy Baby Network at the Erickson Institute. And I want to be very clear that I am not a fan trainer, and this is not going to be a fan training. Uh, my exposure to the uh, fan model comes from attending several fan workshops with Dr. Gilkerson at 
the zero to three conferences over the last decade or so. But she was also a day long lecturer um, at the Napa Fellowship in March of 2022. So we had a whole day with her. I have included a visual of the Home Visitor Fan for those of you who just may want to learn more. And just so you can kind of understand my conceptualization of the work. You know, as a brief summary in the fan model, you, you move from left to right, staying attuned to the other's needs before sort of progressing on to the next steps. But we begin with our own self-regulation before moving on to help co-regulate the other through empathic listening. Um, that's a very similar uh, model, I think, to what Dr. Dan Siegel refers to as that right brain to right brain connection. You're helping to connect that prefrontal cortex with the subcortical, more emotional part of the brain. And then once that other person is regulated, then we can shift into a more reflective stance and be curious together about the possible meaning behind behavior. Those three pieces of the fan also remind me a lot of uh, Dr. Bruce Perry's model, regulate, relate, reason. So you can see some similarity across, um, across research. And then after an opportunity for some reflection, the hope is that the other can develop more intentional and thoughtful next steps and feel really confident and confident about their abilities. And then as a last step, we can reflect together the session. And as a parallel, this is the fan model that's adapted for uh, consultation work that I use as well. So after my reflective supervision session, I just sat down with my fan and I actually drew out a model of what a systems fan would look like for myself. So instead of parents down at the bottom, I added school-based mental health clinics, home visitor, I added myself as the consultant. And at the bottom, I translated the goals, increasing the clinician's confidence, building strong relationships, and healthy team development. You can see here, this is a little embarrassing, but this is my very basic sketch of how I conceptualized my system fan. But it really did become my framework for the next year. I just kept it next to my desk and I had it there for all my meetings. Again, I wanna be really clear, this is just a framework to help my thinking. This has not been published. There's no research on this, just a thought. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm not proud to say that's out loud, but I first really truly needed to recognize how I felt. And if I'm honest with myself, there were times when I felt really offended and disrespected that our attempts to collaborate with the system were so easily dismissed. And many of us um, women in the room uh, wondered if our input was less valued than the white male voices in the room. And we wondered about the role of privilege in the decision-making in our own organization. But after I was able to self-regulate, then I was able to listen to others in the program, understand just how overwhelmed it was, and that they may not have the capacity to take on something new at this time. I realized it takes time to build relationships and that maybe we rushed into it too quickly and we maybe needed to go back to the beginning. So again, there's that core element of patience and relationship building. To think about identifying somebody on their team who could be like a potential champion who might be interested in trying this again. Um, somebody who might see the value in integrating early childhood mental health into their system. So once I reflected on the need to build relationships, I had a plan for that first year. And the first I've all 
on their hiring panel for their expansion. And that really gave me an opportunity to build trust, but also to learn more about the culture and values of their team. And then at that same time, I just asked to be invited and be a part of their monthly collaborative meetings. I wanted to be in the room. And um, they graciously allowed me to be a part of that. And during those meetings, I would make a lot of notes. And I would, uh, every time I would hear a concept where we were aligned, I would just flag that. Like, what did we have in And I just started collecting all these little gems. And we found a lot of common ground in the work of people like Carl Peters and Dan Siegel and D.W. Winnicott and some researchers out of Harvard. And it really provided an opportunity for me to serve as kind of a liaison between the two systems. And because I was really thinking about the system span, I was able to remind my own team um, at times of the parallel process when they maybe wanted to move a little bit too quickly. And I would say to them, you know, remember, we want to be with this system in the same way that we want to be with our families that we serve. We need to follow their lead. And they'd say, okay, you're right, you're right. Um, and that was really helpful in, um, in the partnership. <clears throat> and the third thing I did was uh, I registered as a participant at a professional development series that was offered by their director. And it really allowed for me, I think, to model vulnerability and a willingness for collaborative learning, like something to learn from you. And then I, I also want to just underscore some magical informal opportunities that came up where it just so happened some of their people, new people in my neighborhood, and we had some lovely um, moments at children's birthday parties and sharing about our children. And they would ask how my, you know, my daughter was doing in her college application search. And, um, and they would celebrate, we would celebrate each other's successes. And one of their, um, one of their team even brought me this beautiful plant to congratulate me when my daughter got into college. So never underestimate, I think, the power of relationship building over an occasional glass of wine because that was lovely as well. Okay, so moving on to sort of that second slice of the, of the fan. Once these relationships began to strengthen, I had this really pivotal telephone call with my uh, potential champion. And I was able to share a little bit about my journey into the field of um, infant and early childhood and health. And she shared her reflections on the barriers to that initial pilot. And I've actually included some quotes from that telephone transcript that, that I took um, on that day. You know, she said, we, we just weren't ready for this level of exploration have a knowledge of early learning. Our clinicians don't have a lot of training in early childhood development. We just didn't feel equipped to serve this population and we just didn't have the capacity in year two. So I really began to understand how our partner system was feeling helpless and ill-equipped. And it gave me an opportunity to validate their feelings of vulnerability and we could move into a wondering state together. And we thought about what their system may need in order to feel supported and moving forward. So then we were able to move into that third slice of the fan, the collaborative exploration. And they began to brainstorm a professional development workshop that I might provide to their clinicians and their new associates and their interns and their family navigators and all those professionals they were bringing on board. Uh, they said that they wanted it to be voluntary. They did not want to force clinicians to go to it who did not have that intrinsic motivation. And I thought that was a great idea. And they really asked for me to help them connect the dots 
why would it be important for a clinician, a school-based mental health clinician to know something about early childhood mental health? And so we explained to them about this emerging transitional kindergarten plan that's happening here in California, which will eventually, it's a five-year plan, will eventually be placing all four-year-olds in elementary schools. Um, and we talked about the importance of clinicians being prepared to serve their students in developmentally appropriate ways. We we're saying, you, you have clinicians at these schools and you have four-year-olds who are here and you're gonna have more and more of them in the coming years. And this was big news to them. But we also talked about how, even if you're a school-based mental health clinician and you're serving adolescents, some of those adolescents may have children of their own or they may have siblings that are in need of clinical services. So we really tried to make a case for that. So together we developed this two-phase plan to begin introducing um, professional development to their system. And uh, in April, we did that. I'd say we had about 10 to 12 professionals that attended the workshop that day, which was very exciting. <laughs> As part of the planning for that workshop, I had provided kind of like a menu of potential topics for the clinicians that I already had in the bag of trainings that I typically do. And then they took that back to their team and the clinicians themselves identified which areas they wanted to learn more about. And so highlighted topics are right here and that's the areas that they indicated they wanted to learn more about. So, I'd like to briefly show you a sample of just some of the slides that I used in the workshop in April so you have a sense of what that looked like. This is our title slide. <clears throat> this slide was added at the request of their department as a grounding slide to focus on their central themes and help connect the four concepts from the field. So, so things they were working on to, to what we would be talking about that day. This was our agenda with our topics. You will notice that we took the letter I out. We did not refer to infants. And this was actually at the recommendation of their department because they felt like their clinicians might tune out if they heard infants. They felt like this contact might, the content may be heard better if we first focused on early childhood. And so we decided we will follow your lead, baby steps, and we wanted to meet them where they were at. So we agreed to just call it early childhood mental health consultation. We included a quote on a definition. We uh, showed the wonderful video um, from the Center for the Developing Child at Harvard, along with the in brief uh, handout. Again, this was very intentional. One, because it's just really good, but um, there was some alumni who had been to Harvard. They had um, very strong respect for the research that comes out of Harvard. And so I really hope this would increase buy-in. So this was the in-brief. We included some um, national data on the need for early childhood mental health. But then we also included some local data that was available from our own community in Sacramento that we took from the Help Me Grow department to underscore the needs in our own community. And then in one slide, <laughs> I attempted to briefly summarize some of the foundational concepts of early childhood mental health. Very challenging to do on one slide. And then of course, some of our favorite quotes from the field. Again, this was a really intentional alignment with researchers that had been identified as influential to their department. I had heard them talk about the work of D.W. Winnicott, and that was one of those things I flagged. I was like, we do, we do D.W. Winnicott too. So uh, this was an alignment. Um, in the work that I did with them serving on their hiring panel, I was so impressed 
with um, their commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, justice work. It is such a strength and focus of their work. And I felt like this was another natural alignment of our work in the field. And so I was able to include the diversity informed tenants um, as well. I of course talked about the parallel process with one of our favorite quotes. I included a very brief overview of attachment theory, again, just because it's so central to the work we do, but also this was something they indicated on their survey that they wanted to learn more about. Here is where we connected the dots for the participants. Uh, we were able to talk about that TK expansion, how it's here, it's coming, it's rolling out, but we were also able to highlight where early childhood mental health fits into their community plan. We discussed the economic benefits and the return on investment. We connected how early experiences influence all future relationships, such as adolescents' relationship with their teachers and with their school clinician, so that they could understand the impact of those early childhood experiences. And then this is where we tied it all together for the team. So in one of those earlier planning meetings, the director had shared how they were working towards one common theoretical model across their clinical program. And he joked that they were gonna have these t-shirts made that say, Carl Rogers is my jam. Um, and I really used this insight to create kind of like a crosswalk for their team to see how well early childhood mental health concepts integrate into the work they're already doing with their Rogerian approach. And this was really the hook, I think, that cemented the partnership. A big question and challenge that I kept hearing from their team was, well, how would we bill for this service? So I was able to share with them about the DC zero to five and the crosswalk for DSM billing, which really became a game changer took down some of those barriers. And then I just briefly introduced some modalities for their team to consider. And of course, we shared the research of Walter Gilliam and the role of bias in preschool expulsion rates. This was another opportunity to highlight how early childhood mental health consultation can reduce those suspension and expulsion rates in our community, especially for boys of color. And we included some, some graphs and data for them to see. And this was such an excellent time to be talking about equity and early childhood because the California Department of Education has recently released their new publication that you see here on disrupting disproportional outcomes for young boys of color in early childhood settings. So it was really helpful to have the entire Department of Education have our back and be supporting our work. And then we included some information on the symptoms of early childhood trauma, briefly touched on the concept of reflective supervision, which was a new concept for many on their team. And then lastly, we included resources and opportunities for further training for anybody who was interested. And then we included a long list of resources. So uh, just, I'm gonna quickly recap some um, outcomes because I want us to be able to get to um, our breakout sessions. You know, this collaboration is still very much a work in progress, but I do wanna just report a couple successes that we've had. So um, the first was when I introduced the concept of the parallel process. Um, to their director, and he um, he listened beautifully, and he really shared that that was something he wanted for his program, but he didn't quite have the language to articulate that. So he was really excited about that. Um, and then there was that that slide where I was able to visually share how their Rogerian approach and um, you know early childhood mental health complement each other so well, um, but. There have been other times when I've been out in the field and I've been providing consultation and we've realized one of your clinicians is actually at this school. So we've had 
communities were able to invite in their mental health clinicians and actually provide some early childhood mental health clinicians. So we've started some of that work. Um, and then there's also been opportunity to conversation in these planning meetings where to talk about the different regulatory needs of very young children. And I could just kind of see those light bulbs going off. And, um, and one of the people said, you know, I think, I, you know, I think you might be onto something because, uh, you know, my wife was volunteering in a classroom and she was realizing that young children really regulate well if, if you just kind of give them a hug. Um, but I would never do that with a teenager. And so um, we were able to talk a little bit about the differences and how young children regulate as opposed to adolescents. Um, and so that's been um, a big step forward. And afterwards, um, I received some lovely emails um, from participants who expressed some interest. So I wanted to share one um, who said, I wanted to reach out and say, thank you so much for your time with providing training on early childhood mental health. The training has re-sparked my early childhood attachment work. Your compassion and excitement for the work shines through and it's so inspiring. I just wanted to share, I started looking into the early childhood mental health consultation program. Yes, this was so exciting. And this is a program through the Center for Excellence, by the way. So this was so exciting for me to see. Um, and here was another um, email from an intern um, where he um, talked about how he realizes there's a lot more he needs to know. And um, he's, he's excited about that opportunity. So um, after the training, the director identified that um, sort of out of all those modalities, the one that he felt would be the best fit uh, would be to offer early childhood mental health consultation to some of their sites. So at this point, um, he and my director are currently researching some grant opportunities in order to fund this project and move forward. But, you know, there's still some challenges. Um, Time, uh, their program doubles almost every single year. They're up to almost, I think, 90 staff in their program. So it's a, it's a tremendous undertaking and finding the time to add in this is another challenge. Funding is always a challenge. Um, and then finding a skilled workforce is a challenge. There is only so much of me to go around. Um, and so we really need to build our, our workforce out here in Sacramento County. Okay, at this point, um, I would like to invite you into some breakout groups um, that our tech support is providing. Uh, we're gonna give you about eight minutes in the group. And I'd like you to reflect on two questions. So one is, how might working with systems parallel the consoles? And the second question is, what theoretical models do you use in your consultation work that might be helpful in working with systems? So I think you will see that pop up to go to those breakout rooms. Um, you'll have about eight, eight minutes, I think. Uh, Maybe, you know what, we might be a little bit less because we want to save some time for question and answer and debrief. Um, let's, um, I know we, we need to uh, close out, I believe right now, right? Um, Lisa, is there any last closing remarks from your end? We just want to say thank you for everybody who was able to attend this session today. Make sure if you have more questions to the go to the Center of Excellence website, you can always send an email as well to um, IECMHC at georgetown.edu for uh, specific questions as well. Thanks yes. so much. everybody. Thank you, Stephanie. Yes. And I did. Uh, there's one slide here with my contact information, if anybody would like to contact me directly. And I think you're going to have access to our slides where all of my references are included as well. That's right. All right thanks for attending. Thank you. Bye.